In the next three videos, we are going to work on tools for modeling. In this video, we will work on linear models, and in particular using the function lm from r. We're introducing a couple of uh, new packages here, broom and purr. We'll get to those later. Um, we're going to use Luberdate as well, the rest you've seen before. So first we're going to read in the data set. That all three of these videos will use the same data set. This one is data from annual financial statements. And the annual financial statements, the thing that we're going to try and explain is um, interest expense. So here we have net interest expense, and we're going to have that as a rate rather than this is a dollar value. So all of these are dollar values in millions. So we're going to create that um, variable that we're going to explain, and then some other variables that we're going to use to try to explain interest rate, and then we can apply that to try and predict as well. So we're going to start with this data set, sort it by company and year, group by company. Remember, we group by company to be able to do lags that only go backwards um, towards a specific company, and if it goes to a different company, then it won't have a lag available. So this is the first um, variable that we're going to create. That is the net interest expense divided by the total debt that they had available in, or the, the debt that they had in the current year and in the prior year. Of course, there are some other things we could think about. That since this is net interest expense, maybe we should have net debt here, so total debt minus financial assets, so that's another possibility we could do. Um, but for now, we'll just use this one. So what are the things that we can use to explain the, the rate that a company has to face on their debt? So we can think about all kinds of things that might be part of that modeling. Um, I'm just going to introduce four here. but to really do a good job of predicting and explaining things, then we need the variables that actually work to explain you know, whatever we're trying to explain. And so this is a central part of creating models, is coming up with the right variables uh, measured the right way to explain things. So I'm just going to use four here that I thought, you know, that are intuitively should be related to the rate that you're charged as uh, on interest. So let me start with the bottom one because that's most obvious. If you have more cash available, this is sort of like um, collateral that you have, uh, then you should get a lower interest rate. And meaning that if you could pay off the debt anyway, then you know, getting the debt it would be um, less risky, or at least from the lender, it's less risky. So having a lot of cash should reduce your interest rate. Leverage, I'm using a particular type of leverage here, total debt over debt and assets. The reason I'm using this version is because then it guarantees that um, the leverage number is between 0 and 1. But we could try other measures as well. Uh, the reasoning here is if you have lots of debt already, then maybe you should have a higher interest rate. Total assets, the same thing as the cash, if you have more assets available, that's more collateral for taking out the loan. So it should be reduce your interest rate. And then finally, I'm using gross margin as a percent of revenue. So how much, you know, how profitable you are as a company, maybe that should lead to lower um, costs because you'll have more lower interest rates because you'll have more um, cash flow to help pay off that interest. A couple of things to notice here. Notice I have lag on all of these. So if I'm trying to predict something, you know, I'm trying to predict interest rate, notice there's not a lag in this, the, the numerator. There is one in the denominator, so that's a little bit of a subtle issue. Um, but in general, if we're trying to predict it, it can't be, uh, the thing that we're trying to predict has to be after the things that are available. Um, for us to predict with. So we need different time periods. So here this is time t. These are all time t minus 1. So when we move to a new data set where we don't know the interest rate, we could then predict what the interest rate would be with things that we can observe. 
Um, another thing we have here is total assets is has very, very large values in it. So notice I took the natural log of those assets so that we can make the distribution a little easier to work with. So we run these, create the variables. And after we have the variables, we're going to sort of uh, look at the data and see what happens or how the data looks. So these last ones are the ones that we've created this interest rate. Notice we have an interest rate from minus 9% to a huge percent. These don't seem like interest rates a bank would charge, right? They're not going to give you money to be borrowing and they're not going to charge an outrageous interest rate. The rest though seem pretty reasonable from 5% to 10%. Um, in the interquartile range, so that seems reasonable, but we're going to have to deal with these that are not reasonable interest rates. Um, the profit margin, also very, very large negative, some quite large positives. Those are going to cause some problems. So again, these could be errors, or they could just be so extreme that they're going to influence our estimates. Either way, we should consider those. The log of total assets, um, because it's a natural log, we have some negatives. That's because there are some that are less than a million. And we have some fairly large, but as you'll see, the distribution looks okay. Leverage from zero to one, that's sort of how I designed that variable. So that seems to make sense. And log of cash is like log of total assets. To look at these a little bit more, we can look at the distributions. So this is another function for histogram. I, you can, I just use when I want to do it really quickly. Um, and notice the distribution of a log of total assets doesn't look like there's anything really far out there. The distribution looks sort of like a normal distribution, so we're not too concerned about that. Same thing with the log of cash. Leverage also looks sort of reasonable, right? More have lower leverage, some have some pretty large leverage. Not quite a normal distribution, but not horrible. There are no big outliers that are going to cause us problems. And profit margin, Notice we've got, we can't even see the distribution because we've got some very large values out here and just a few of them. So let's look at the extremes of the quantiles. So notice at the first percentile, it's minus 10. And finally, at the fifth percentile, it's minus 0.05. And at the 99th percentile, 99.9th percentile, it's only up to one. So it's these few really extreme ones that are causing the problems. It's just a handful of, of uh, observations. So we could get rid of some of those. There are a few ways we could do that. We could remove the outliers. Or another way, here's a new option. So we had removed outliers before. Another option is we could just rank them and say, do you have really low profit margins or do you have really high profit margins? So here I'm going to uh, rank the variables every year. So we need first we need a year that we can deal with. And the reason we're ranking within each year is because if we rank on the whole data set, then we're not going to be able to predict when we go to new data. So presumably every year we're going to have all of the information. So ranking on that seems to make sense. So we have period end in here. Well, the Lubridate function gives us the ability to manipulate dates. So here we're going to take the year of the period end. If we look over here, period end is just a normal date. So here 1989, January 31st. Year will give us just the year of that date. And again, we need the lubridate func function for this. Then I'm going to group by year. And then this one's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to rank this profit margin variable. So going to use the rank function. The variable is profit margin. The ties method tells it how do we rank when we have two values that are the same. So we're here I'm telling it to use the maximum rank. So if there are two that are tied and one is uh, 95 and the other is 94, then it will move them both to the maximum value, the maximum rank of 95. Then so this is all the ranking part. So it's going to rank from one to however many they are in that year. Um, and what will come out of this is a count of, of each of those. 
if we divide by the number that, that are in that year, so n is a special function that n of whatever group we're looking at, so we're here, we've got the group year, so dividing by n is how many are in that year. So then this gives us a percentile ranking from 1 to 100, or 0 to 1, so 100% um, percentile rankings. So if we run this, and we look at the data, you will see at the end here, we've got this ranking that goes from 0 or near 0 up to 1. So then we've got a ranking in percentile terms. What that does is allow us to keep these extremes, but just puts them in, in order, and there's no, um, there's no extreme values because it's just a count of the ranks. So we're going to use that, this method this time. Now, um, when we go to do predictions, we want to only fine-tune models on one data set and then use it to predict on another data set. This is going to be especially important when we start to work on machine learning models. So here I'm going to create a training data set, and how I'm going to do this is just use all of the data before or in 2010 as the training data, and then anything after 2010 as the testing data. Of course, there are other ways to come up with training and testing data. We could randomly um, select data or take um, different parts of different years, alternate years, or there are different things we could use. We'll just use this um, first part of the data, second part of the data. Okay, we've got this. Now that we've set it up, on the training data, maybe we want to be concerned about that interest rate. So remember, it has some very large extremes. So we look at this interest rate, and um, at the very large extremes, we had something in the thousands. Here we have 4.6. That is 400%. Um, so still, that's quite large for an interest rate. So it's not a, a rate that a bank would charge for taking out debt. So it's not reasonable to think that, that is, there's something that in the data that doesn't represent taking out debt. Okay, so I'm just going to look at those that have an interest rate greater than 35% because I want to see how many I'm going to lose, how many observations I'm going to lose, because I can't see a bank charging more than 35% for a loan. So we're just trying to get rid of data that doesn't represent what we hope it represents. So we run this, look and see, temp says we've got 2,000, a little over 2,000 observations. So it's changed since I did the data before. But here, so we have, we're losing about 2,000 um, observations, which is, uh, you know, if we look here, it's in between here, it's about, you know, 5% or something like that of our data. Doesn't seem outrageous, but, you know, we could go in and try and fix that even more if we really wanted to. And there are lots of ways you could do this. We could just use 35% here and only keep that. I wanted to use sort of a more general method. Here I'm going to keep only the interest rates that are between zero, so I'm getting rid of the negative interest rates. And between those that are, are uh, less than the, the 99.5 percentile. So 99.5 would be an interest rate above 100%. That's probably a little generous. Um, so when we look and see currently the train data, 116, 180, run this, 115, 96. So we're, we're going to still have some data in there that's a little bit too large of an interest rate. We could change this uh, even more. So let's, let's say we want to be at the 99th percentile. That would be 60% interest rate. Still a little high, but we could do that. Or we could, you know, we could keep going down until we get something that we're comfortable with. In the end, there's no sort of correct solution, but we, we want data that we think will represent uh, what we hope it represents, in this case, the interest rate. So I moved down to 99th percentile here. Um, there's no sort of set number, we could probably mess around with this until we found the number that seems to represent what we hope it does. All right, so then we're going to move into the modeling part. So again, modeling, you're estimating associations between variables. And uh, this, this is, we create the model and we set, set up a model all with the training data. So we're 
trying to figure out how things work, create that model. Then when we go to predict, we use the model and apply it to some other data set. In our, and this, it'll be our testing data set. What we never do is estimate a model on the testing data. So here we estimate this model. Um, how you, this is LM, that's a linear model. How you set up a formula in R is we have the Y variable, this tilde tells it that it's a formula, and all these X variables here, we just put them in by saying profit margin plus says and this and that and that, so we keep adding more things to the model. We tell it that it's coming from the training data set, so then this function, LM, creates a model, or it estimates the model. Well, then it gives us this model object over here. It's not super helpful for us to look at, but it gives a lot of output. So we've got the residuals, the coefficients, a bunch of things that um, we don't usually look at. But if we want to see the summary of that, we can output it, the summary of the model, and it will give us the main insights to that model. So it tells you what the formula was that it ran. These are the residuals. We won't talk too much about those right now. And um, these are the coefficients. This estimate column are the coefficients. Those are an estimate of the partial correlation. So how correlated is profit margin, for example, with the interest rate? Or how correlated is cash with the interest rate? And so we get a few interesting things here. By the way, it does matter on what you take out of the extreme. So if you mess around with that, you'll get something that's you know, sort of different. Um, but let's look at, let's sort of interpret some of this. So the estimates, we talked about the T values and the P values. That's what these two are here at the last. Standard errors are used to calculate the T values and the P values. And then R gives you these stars as sort of a rough approach to what is significant. So more significant are more stars. Nothing is if it's less significant. Um, and so notice on here, the p-value is large and the t-value is small. So it's saying that profit margin is not a significant explanatory, explanatory variable for in the interest rate. What are some things we do see? Well, um, just, to, just working on the coefficients, higher assets, so this is like the um, collateral, high, more collateral, lower interest rates. So the negative on there says it's lower. It's not the same with cash though, so higher cash, higher interest rates. So um, those two are a little bit conflicting in terms of what we thought would happen. This is probably because of, you know, these interest rates that were, you know, we're excluding some and not excluding other, or we're missing some other variables. Leverage, again, doesn't quite go the way we would think. Higher leverage, lower um, interest rates, not quite what we would expect here. And profit margin isn't significant, but we could try and interpret the, the sign that higher profit margins, higher interest rates, even though that's not significant. So we only got really one of the things we expected, that is higher, lever or higher assets is related to lower interest rates. And perhaps after controlling for the effect of assets, everything else doesn't really matter, right? It's the most significant, right? So this is the most large in absolute magnitude T value. Then next come these other ones. So really the assets is the dominant factor here, the dominant thing that is explaining um, interest rates. But these other ones seem to matter some somewhat, but we, but it's sort of hard to interpret what they mean. All right, so there's the first part. Well, sometimes we might want to look at how things um, change over time and what, what is affecting things over time, and or by industry or other groups. So we're going to estimate the same model by year, and there are, you, know, you could do it by any sort of groups, and this is introducing some other tools. Um, these are the new packages up here the broom and purr, and show you how to estimate things by different groups. So 
let me show you what these do. So tidy is a function, you output it, it just puts it into a nice table. So takes all that output, now it's in a table you could use for other things. But notice it's the exact same thing as we have over here for the coefficients. So nothing super um, different there. Glance, what it does is take the summary variables. So th these are the fit of the model. So when we go back up here, the fit here was the adjusted R squared or the R squared. And those tell us the how much the X variables explain the Y variable. It's not completely reliable as, as this interpretation all the time, but let's sort of explain it. So higher percent. So if we had 100% R squared, which is never happens, and there's something wrong if you do have that, um, but the, the higher R squared, your variables that you put in the model explain the Y variable better. So the higher this is, the better the model is at fitting the data or the Y variable. Here at 7%, this is fairly typical for all of the models we do in sort of finance and accounting. So that's okay, right? Like we very rarely get super high um, R squared values, but we could compare one model to another and say, this one gets really high um, R squared, the other one gets really low. The main point of this glance function is that it gives you the fit output and then augment and we'll put it in a try object here. It puts in the, uh, the fitted, so that's the thing that the model has um, predicted the value should be, and then other parts of the, from the model. So the residual is the difference between what actually happened and what the model predicted would happen, and then some other stuff that we're not going to look into too much, although if you do a statistics thing, you could look at them. Okay, so the reason all that's important is because it helps you see what we're going to do. So in D Diplier, in Diplier, we're, we're going to do something by year, and there's a function called do. So what, it, what we can do is tell it for each group, do the thing that's in this here, okay? And tidy, what it's going to do is put in, um, it's going to create a data set for whatever comes out of here. So remember up here, tidy, just um, output the, the table of the main um, summary of the model. So it's going to do that summary output for each of those. The dot here says the data that we're already working with, which is coming from train, the training function, I mean, data set and this year. And so it will do this linear regression model. That's the do part. Do this linear regression model by year and tidy up the output to look like this. So we can run this. Look at the out. Notice what has happened is now for each year, 1988 here, it's run a regression model and it's given all of the output here. Does it again for the next one, all of the output here for the next year. The benefit of this is we can look at these coefficients by year and see what happens over time. Or if we had different industries, we could do the same sort of thing. So let's plot this and see, um, we'll do the estimate by year and we're gonna color each term. So look in this out part, the term tells us which coefficient, the estimate is the coefficient. So we'll plot it and see what it looks like. And we see here the intercept is, you know, the largest one and stays up here. So notice with the leverage, it goes from negative down here, reaches up to positive and then back down. Well, the idea that higher leverage equals higher interest rates, we have at least in some period, but it have a huge negative going on here. Um, the total assets, notice that the, it was, negative but small up here and it's gotten bigger as we go along here so um, then the others are you know fairly small and don't seem to have really big noticeable trends so what this helps us do is start to understand what has been happening over time and whether um, 
you know, if we wanted to interpret this, this um, assets, um, higher assets matter more and more over time. So the ne more negative coefficient, meaning if you had higher assets before, it only mattered a little bit, but now when we get way out here, then having higher assets really matters in terms of getting a lower interest rate. And we can simplify this to look at a specific term. So here we'll look at the, because those were so small before, maybe we can look at just the um, profit margin. So taking from that out data set, filtering to keep only the profit margin coefficient, and then plot the same thing, but notice we're not using the colors because we only have a single line. Here, well, we've got something weird happening right at the beginning, so maybe we want to remove the 80, late 80s, but after that, it sort of just declines a little bit, so that one's not really interesting. Two, this is, a, you know, gives us a very different picture, so higher cash, down here we have it's basically zero, and it has increased, sort of stays stable during this period, but is much higher towards the end. Well, one of the reasons that can be happening is companies that tend to have lots of cash also are ones that tend to have high interest rates. So it's not that the bank is charging higher interest rates because you have more cash, it's that the companies that are, that have more cash get higher interest rates. So it's, you know, an interpretation problem. All right, the main thing I want you to get out of this is the attempt to start trying to interpret these models. Let me go through the main points here. So we have to think about what variables need to go into these models. These variables that predict need to be before the thing that we're trying to predict. And we need to think carefully about what those variables look like, their distributions. One of the new ways we can deal with outliers is by ranking and when we are training models, we need to train them on a training data set and not estimate them on the testing data set. We deal with outliers also, and then we estimate the model. We need to think about how to interpret the model, and there are times when we can do these models by different groups. This by groups thing is sort of an advanced tool. It doesn't We don't maybe use it all the time, uh, but I just wanted you to be exposed to that possibility. All right, so have a little bit of fun with this. We will work through more intuition on it in class, and then we're going to switch to what are typically called machine learning models uh, on the next few videos.